Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. Russian President Vladimir Putin is willing to hold peace talks with Ukraine, but wants the West to first recognize its new territories annexed a couple of months ago in Ukraine. Many countries condemned Russia's move over a referendum in which it says majority of the people wanted to be part of Russia. Four regions were annexed at the end of September, even though Russia does not control any of them. President Putin's remarks are in reaction to U.S. President Joe Biden saying he was ready to meet the Russian leader if in fact there is an interest of, in him deciding that he is looking for a way to end the war. Well, more on that now. President Biden was making the comment during a state dinner held in honor of his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron. He told the room of VIPs that he has no immediate plans to contact the Russian president, but is prepared to speak with him if he shows an interest in ending the war in Ukraine and only in consultation with other NATO allies. Presidents Biden and Macron pledged solidarity with Ukraine against Russia's war and vowed to work together. He's inflicting incredible, incredible carnage on the civilian population of Ukraine, bombing nurseries, hospitals, children's homes. It's sick what he's doing. But the fact of the matter is, I have no immediate plans to contact Mr. Putin. I'm prepared to speak with Mr. Putin if, in fact, there is an interest in him society and he's looking for a way to end the war. He hasn't done that yet. And what is at stake in Ukraine is not just very far from here, in a small country somewhere in Europe, but it's about our, our values and it's about our principles. And it's about what we agreed together in the UN Charter, protecting sovereignty in territorial integrity. And while the leaders sat down to warm dinners and talks and negotiations, Kyiv in the meantime faces a dark winter after Russia targeted infrastructure during the last months of the autumn. Despite periodical absence of electricity, water and heat supply, Kyiv residents are trying to lead regular lifestyles, going to work, visiting cafes and even dancing in public spaces. A mayor told residents on Thursday to stock up on water, food and warm clothes in case of a total blackout caused by Russian airstrikes and said residents should consider staying with friends in the outskirts of the capital if they could. Mayor Vitaly Klitschko warned that the temperature in the homes could drop rapidly in the event of a blackout and destruction of infrastructure and a total absence of electricity, water supply, drainage and heat supply. Well, in Bakhmut, a group of Ukrainian paramedics rushed into a field hospital behind the front line, carrying a wounded soldier, another casualty of intense fighting in the Donetsk region. Russian forces have repeatedly tried to seize Bakhmut, which sits on a main road leading to the cities of Slovyansk and Kramatyorsk. Both are situated in the industrial Donbass region, which Moscow has yet to fully capture. Earlier this week, Ukraine's armed forces reported heavy shelling of a number of eastern frontline villages near the city of Bakhmut. Now, Bakhmut has been an important target for Russia's armed forces in a slow advance through the Donetsk region since Russia took the industrial town of Lyshysansk and Severodonetsk in June and in July. Ukraine said the Wagner Group, a private Russian military company, is heavily involved in the Bakhmut fighting. Wagner, staffed by mercenaries and veterans of the Russian armed forces, was founded in 2014 after Russia annexed Crimea. It's been providing support to pro-Russia separatists in Donbass. We finally get to see inside the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine's energy and narrowed her, including a control room and turbine halls. A reports in Russian media citing Enerida City Administration said nuclear plant staff were currently in the process of getting new labor contracts, Russian passports and bank cards for receiving their salaries wages. In the Ria Novosti video, a man identified as an official from Russia's uh, energy firm says all staff at the nuclear power plant possess the know-how to safely operate the reactors. Moscow did so on Wednesday, promoted the chief engineer of Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear plant to become its head filling us a position that was vacant. There's been vacant since November. The nuclear power plant, Europe's biggest, has been under control of Russian forces since March, a days after Moscow launched what it refers to as a special military operation in Ukraine. 
And from President Volodymyr Zelensky, we hear the country's top security officials ordering an investigation into the activities of a branch of the Orthodox Church linked historically to Moscow. President Zelensky said the probe would look into whether the Moscow branch of the church was entitled to operate at one of Ukraine's most hallowed sites, the Pachesk Lavra complex in Kyiv. The Orthodox Church in Russia has lavishly backed the Kremlin's nine-month-old invasion of Ukraine. The Moscow-linked church formerly severed ties with the Russian Orthodox Church last May, but is still mistrusted by many Ukrainians and accused of secret cooperation with Russia. The discussion by top security officials underscored the importance with which Zelensky and other leaders still view the influence of the Moscow-linked church among ordinary Ukrainians. And spokesperson for the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Oleg Nikolenko, says blood soap packages containing animal eyes have been sent to six Ukrainian embassies across Europe. The packages were found in Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Croatia, and in Austria. It's not clear who sent the packages to the embassies and consulates, but Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuliba believes a well-planned campaign of terror and intimidation of Ukrainian embassies and consulates is taking place. Two days ago, an employee was injured after a letter bomb exploded at Ukraine's embassy in Madrid, Spain, one of the series of alleged incidents. Mr. Nikolenko referred to a number of others in a statement released on Facebook, including that the entrance to the premises of the Ukrainian ambassador to the Vatican have also been vandalized. Let's bring in the viewers, uh, Anna Chernikova. She's in Kyiv. Anna, great to see you. Well, I know uh, with very limited electricity, you're trying uh, your best uh, to at least bring us uh, an up-to-date uh, reports of what's going on in Ukraine. How are the people reacting, however, to the talks going on between French President Emmanuel Macron and President Biden, um, talking about sitting down with the Russian president, who's also said he's willing to talk, but he wants you know, conditions. Um, he wants the West to accept those uh, 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 regions that were annexed by Russia just two months ago before any kind of negotiations could take place regarding ending the war in Ukraine. Uh, good evening. Well, first of all, uh, Ukrainians, um, well, th th there, is, uh, th th there is a very clear message from all the uh, international partners of Ukraine that no negotiations uh, on any war um, outcomes would be done without Ukraine. So Ukraine do not really worry uh, about the fact that uh, neither of, uh, any of the, the, of the presidents of, from the international community could uh, have negotiations about anything regarding Ukraine uh, without Ukraine being involved. Uh, these talks, uh, well, they just show once again that uh, Russia is not ready to talk. And basically what Russian president mentioned once again uh, confirms uh, what he mentioned a couple of months ago, that uh, he has uh, his uh, conditions and this is the only conditions he is ready to negotiate uh, upon. So um, I don't really think that this would make, uh, you know, a huge, uh, rea this is making a huge reaction here in Ukraine. Uh, of course, um, Ukraine is not really taking serious any, uh, you know, anything that President Putin is saying or Russian officials are saying because uh, for all this more than nine months, uh, Russian Federation has already proven that they do not keep their word and they do not follow whatever they are announcing. So uh, I think that in general, everyone understands that at a certain point it should be negotiation, but definitely the conditions of these negotiations are uh, would be decided at the front line, at the battlefield, and are deciding right now and at this point of time by the Ukrainian soldiers at the battlefields uh, along the uh, front line. Now, one of the fallouts of this war has been, you know, the emergence of these uh, unknown packages showing up at Ukrainian embassies across Europe. And uh, there is fear that there could be more. Uh, Dmitry Kuliba, the foreign minister, said it's a well-planned campaign of terror and intimidation of Ukrainian embassies and consulates. Uh, do you think that Russia is behind it or Russia's allies are behind it? Well, I think this is exactly what, uh, what in general, uh, everyone is thinking, and uh, Ukraine particularly, uh, of course, uh, well, connecting these actions with Russian Federation or 
whoever is you know under uh, under the actions uh, ruled by Russian Federation because uh, well the war is going on and uh, Rus uh, Russian forces are not successful at the battlefield. Uh, Russian uh, forces are targeting civilian infrastructure and critical infrastructure to make Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian nation suffer because, again, because they are not um, uh, successful at the battlefield and we can see it from, from what is happening uh, at the front lines. So definitely Ukrainian uh, side is, uh, of course, connecting this with uh, Russia. Uh, Mr. Kuleba mentioned that investigation is ongoing and there are some details already that might be announced uh, sometime soon. Uh, at least this is what everyone is waiting for, uh, because, of course, um, uh, well, it, it, it is important to understand uh, if there are any, you know, details available and if there are any, um, anything, you know, important would be revealed. Uh, of course, it is important not only for Ukrainian society, but also for the international society, because not only Ukrainian embassies and consulates have been under the target, but also uh, in Spain, for instance, uh, Spanish um, uh, military uh, complexes as well. So, uh, I mean, uh, no one, uh, so there is no official reaction from Ukrainian side with any, uh, uh, with, with accusing no one. So, uh, for the moment, we are waiting for the details from uh, either Mr. Kuleba or Mr. Zelensky. Uh, but definitely, investigation is ongoing, and definitely, Ukraine would not just leave this uh, accident behind. Uh, Ukraine will find uh, will find out what's going on and why it is going on, and of course, prove evidence uh, for whatever is whatever outcome is. The winter has started, Anna, and I know that um, you, as well as other Ukrainians, are trying uh, really hard to keep warm. I mean, uh, the mayor of uh, Kiev has, uh, request, has suggested people uh, pile up on blankets, uh, probably consider evacuating perhaps to other uh, towns and cities where they might have friends, uh, where the conditions are better, where they probably have better power supply at the moment because the Russian strikes have been hitting those infrastructure and destroying them um, and he's asking people to prepare for a blackout uh, how are people heeding that warning um, are people leaving Kiev uh, to go to other cities or are they staying put well I should say that those people who have opportunity to go in the countryside to leave a house in a separate house uh, and uh, use generator as an alternative source of energy of course, they use this opportunity. I know also that, uh, for instance, in Kyiv, a lot of Kyiv citizens are thinking of uh, renting a house uh, uh, in the outskirts of Kyiv to actually be, uh, you know, um, uh, be autonomous in terms of energy supply. Uh, again, uh, of course, it's not it's not going to be like a complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, let's say a complete uh, autonomous li life because, of course, everything is connected to the city's infrastructure. But uh, still, uh, at least it would be more, you know, opportunities to use uh, these generators um, if you are living in the countryside. But uh, in general, people are, so in, in the cities, people are uh, trying to, you know, make sure that they have, um, so they have at least certain, uh, certain, uh, I should say, um, um, uh, you know, possibilities to be as much, uh, you know, to support uh, energy system as much as possible. And for instance, a lot of Kiev citizens, for example, they are buying these big power banks in order mm -hmm. to use them. So... For instance, for a couple of days in a row, there is a blackout and then recharge when the electricity is back. Uh, and to be able to be, to, to, you know, to charge phones, to charge laptops, to be uh, online, to be, uh, you know, um, to be connected. And of course, to be able to work. This is very important. Also, as you correctly mentioned, a lot of people, of course, buying blankets, buying warm clothes in order to be warm inside because also heating is not uh, it's not going to be as it is usual. So um, heat inside the houses, inside the apartments would be much lower than usual. And um, also people buy a lot of uh, you know candles, which, you know, it's not really an autonomous uh, source of energy, but at least it's, it creates a little bit more, you know, warm environment inside. And also people buy this, you know, touristic gas ovens in order to be able to, 
cook if there is no electricity and if there, there is no other possibility. But anyways, uh, I cannot say that people are massively leaving cities or particularly in Kyiv or in any other cities. Of course, those who have families, for example, or friends uh, in the Western part of Ukraine, they uh, might consider that. But for the moment, there is no massive, uh, you know, evacuation or anything like that. There are also uh, thousands of uh, Heating points working in the city, organized by the law, by, by by the government and by the local authorities. So uh, Ukrainians are actually getting ready to, you know, overcome this uh, very difficult winter. Well, I think it's the most difficult winter for in Ukraine's modern history, and I mean, I mean, many experts think so. So uh, Ukraine is just ready to this difficult, uh, difficult environment and difficult, um, difficult. Um, um, consequences of these attacks, but uh, anyways, uh, Ukrainians are not really, you know, massively leaving their homes because whatever it is, it's better to be at home. Indeed, uh, they'd feel safer, of course. And, and this is a topic we really have never discussed, and that's Ukrainians and their faith. I'm talking about the church now that uh, President Zelensky has uh, ordered an investigation into uh, because he suspects it still has links. Uh, with the Moscow, with Moscow, um, uh, how are Ukrainians with their faith? Uh, it's a largely Christian country, um, but throughout this war, have more people been in churches or held prayer services since the war started, or uh, are people just being more practical about things? Well, religions play a very important role in Ukraine for many years. Uh, I think that not even years, but centuries, because Kyiv was the first city in this area that was uh, Christian. So uh, basically, um, and, and this is a very important, you know, discussion for for a lot of years, for decades. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians are against this uh, Orthodox Church, which is ruled by Russian Church. And um, unfortunately, when Ukraine became independent in 1991, this Russian Church took over most of the uh, biggest cathedrals in Ukraine and particularly uh, the biggest, you know, religious um, complexes like Lavra, for example, like Kiva Pichars Lavra and other Lavras around Ukraine. And a lot of Ukrainians, uh, especially you know, um, at around 2014, when war started, wanted the Russian church to be out of Ukraine. Uh, of course, there are some supporters still, but uh, with the beginning of full-scale invasion, uh, more and more people are actually, uh, you know, showing their support uh, for Ukrainian church, because in Ukraine you have, so basically there is there are two kind of branches. So it's Ukrainian church under Kyiv monarchy and uh, sorry, uh, under Kyiv, um, uh, a Kyiv religious institution and Ukrainian, so-called Ukrainian church under Moscow religion institution. So uh, most of Ukrainians do not consider this U Ukrainian church under Moscow um, uh, religious institution as Ukrainian church. Uh, people consider it as Russian church and actually it is this way. So uh, most of Ukrainians want Ukraine to have only one Orthodox Church, main Orthodox Church, which would be Ukrainian Church. And uh, the, this Ukrainian Church is existing and is getting more and more supporters. And uh, of course, uh, well, and of course, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this, this church uh, actually got international support as well, because for a lot of years it was this fight inside the country because Russian church had much more, you know, sponsors, much more money and much more power inside the country. And uh, today, uh, a lot of Ukrainians are actually happy with these decisions, and especially because there were a lot of cases that proved that uh, a lot of Russian church institutions were actually acting uh, internally inside the country as, uh, you know, with this pro-Russian um, movement and uh, pro-Russian rhetoric. And of course, when full-scale invasion started and now when the war is still ongoing, uh, most of Ukrainians think it's that it's unacceptable to have this church inside the country tough choice they have to make between their faith and their country. Thank you again, Anna, and do stay safe. Thank you.
A European Union countries will be considering today a proposal for a gas price cap slightly lower than a Brussels proposal, as some view as too high, with a handful of countries pushing for an even lower limit, according to documents uh, seen by many news media in Europe. European Union countries start negotiations today, at least this evening, on the European Commission's proposal for a cap to limit uh, gas prices and are racing to reach a deal by December 13. A commission last week proposed a gas price cap that would kick in if the month, if the front month title transfer facility gas price exceeded 275 euros per megawatt per hour uh, for two weeks and was 58 euros higher than a liquefied natural gas reference price for 10 days. As some countries criticize the original EU proposal, including suggestions it was designed with such a high price and criteria, so strict that the cap would never be triggered and thus fail to cushion their economies from price hikes. Well, also this week, Qatar agreed to send up to 2 million tons of LNG a year to Germany for a period of 15 years. It's only a small portion of what Germany needs, but the deal is still significant for some. It's a step towards diversification and supporting energy security. For others, it's a clear example of German double standards. On the one hand, the government has criticized Qatar's authorities for its handling of human rights, while on the other, it signs long-term deals with them. Let's bring in Deutsche Welle's Thomas Sparrow for more. Thomas, great to see you. What does a deal with Qatar entail? Qatar will send LNG, so liquefied natural gas, to Germany over a period of 15 years, something that, by the way, German politicians had been skeptical about during negotiations. It also means that the deal will not start immediately. It will only start in a few years' time. And it also means that it, only, it will only represent a small portion of the amount of gas that Germany needs on a yearly basis. However, from a political perspective, it is an important deal because Germany has been trying to diversify its energy sources since the war in Ukraine began, a war that, by the way, revealed Germany's dependence on Russian energy, in particular on Russian gas. So since the war in Ukraine started, Germany has tried to look for different energy suppliers around the world, and one of those energy suppliers is indeed Qatar. Now, there has been criticism here in Germany about possible double standards, if you will, from Germany. On the one hand, Germany has been criticizing Qatar for its human rights record. On the other hand, German leaders are now making very important business deals with those same Qatari authorities. So all in all, it's a deal that entails, obviously, an important number of, of or an important element of gas that comes to, to Germany, but it's also politically very controversial. It is controversial. And Germany's football team covered their mouths ahead of their opening match at the World Cup in protest against the host nation, Qatar. Could that affect diplomatic relations between the two countries? Well, it has meant that from both sides there has been uh, criticism. We've seen German leaders criticize Qatar. We've seen Qatari leaders criticize Germany from an economic perspective. However, it is a deal that both nations actually want, or at least both governments actually want. Germany is in need for international suppliers, and Qatar can be one of those suppliers. In fact, Qatari leaders stress that they were contributing to energy security in Europe by signing these kinds of deals with Germany. But there is a concern here in Germany and more broadly in Europe about signing those deals with countries that do not necessarily see eye to eye with Germany or with other European countries when it comes to human rights or when it comes to other values. So there is a concern that there could be problems along the road, maybe not problems immediately now that the deal has signed, but indeed problems as events progress, as that deal develops. And that is something that Germany already saw, for example, with Russia and with that energy dependence that I already mentioned. Uh, Thomas, just before you go, what kind of impact will it have in helping Germany diversify its energy sources? So very little when it comes to the actual amount of gas that comes from Qatar compared to the amount of gas that Germany needs every year. But that was also part of the of the deal. That was the interest that Germany had to diversify, to have as many suppliers as possible so as to reduce any possible dependence from one supplier in particular. So those who see this deal from a positive light, if you will, say that this is an important step towards that diversification. Those who view it critically say that Germany should not be making these kinds of deals 
with countries like Qatar, which along the way could pose political or even economic problems. So it is a very controversial deal, mostly from a political standpoint. And it comes, by the way, at a time when Germany has been really critical about Qatar. Qatar, obviously, in the news because of the World Cup. So all in all, a deal that is being followed very, very closely by political authorities and experts here in Germany to see what political implications it will have, what economic, politi what economic implications it will have as well. well. Thanks a lot, Sir Thomas, for bringing us up to speed.